and we'll call this meeting back to order at 6.33. We'll begin by saying that pursuant, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the North Reading School Committee is being conducted virtually. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. A reminder that persons who would like to listen to this meeting while in progress may do so and are invited to participate during public comment and at other appropriate times during the meeting. Okay, since I can't see everybody right this second, I know Dr. Daly is letting people in right now, or actually I think they just might be coming in. So I wanna make sure that we're all here. So I'm gonna do a call of the committee. Uh, Mr. McGowan, are you here? I am. Uh, Mrs. Boutwell? I'm here. Mrs. Imbriano? Present. Mr. Papavasilio? Present. I'm here as well, as well as our superintendent, Dr. Daly, and our assistant superintendent, Michael Connolly. So we're gonna to begin tonight with public input. If anybody has any comments or questions they would like to bring up that is not uh, about an, um, something that's on our agenda tonight, please let me know. Okay, hearing none. We're gonna to go to the student report. Um, I don't believe there is a student report, but I believe Shivi Srikanth, I, I, I believe you are here, I saw you. Um, do you have anything to say, anything to add? Are you our student rep for the day? Um, yeah, both me and Sophia Galupo are here just to give our thoughts on the reopening committee's um, decision for the hybrid plan. Um, so I'm in reopening group A, which is a hybrid group for the high school. And class schedules have come out today for us high schoolers, so we know what classes we're in. And that came out through Plus Portals. Um, just for some thoughts on how it's been going from the student point of view, I think the plan that we have will be effective, especially to ease the concerns of every stakeholder in the community. It's really taking everything into account. And I'm definitely excited to be back. Um, I also felt really lucky that I was able to have a part in discussing the model and providing feedback um, and getting an early look at the reopening plan. The student survey results that I collected for Dr. Daly from some other students were definitely well reflected in what the model ended up showing as well. Um, and then some additional thoughts as well. I thought that the student information meeting that was held was well moderated and it was um, very important to make sure every student got their answers um, for different questions they might have had regarding the reopening meeting. So I really appreciate the reopening committee taking student concerns into account when creating the plan. And from talking to my peers, they're all equally excited about going back to school and what the hybrid model is showing. Um, and obviously there'll be a lot of challenges that come up as the school year progresses, but I'm confident we'll be able to match all of them, so. Excellent, thank you so much. One quick question on what you just said. The um, student meeting that you, that you mentioned that was well moderated, how many students uh, attended and what grades were those? Um, they did seem to be pretty well range of grades it was um, centered a lot around younger grades as well as older grades the middle school and early high school regions weren't super well represented there but, uh, there were maybe around 45 to 50 students there if i'm remembering correctly but mr daly might be able to talk to that a little bit better excellent thank you and sophia did you want to add comments as well uh should we put that like really well uh we were pretty much through the same we've been in the same position throughout this entire summer and i feel like going into the fall because we're in the same cohort and just a lot of our situation is really similar so i don't want to just repeat what Shivy said but i feel like my friends and myself we all kind of agree that this situation that we're in with the hybrid model and it's just so well developed by everyone who worked so hard this summer in planning it. Um, it really takes in all of the aspects that you want in your high school experience because we have that social part that's so crucial. But then obviously everyone's safety is always the top priority. So I think it was just very, very well developed and I'm very grateful for it. So thank you. And I know both of you have been in a lot of different meetings over the summer, so we appreciate that. Um, do any of the other committee members have any questions or 
thoughts for our students? Mr. Buckley, I'll just add to answer your yeah. question. There was about a little over 50 students, I'd say, that were on that call. There was, um, and it was a range. I, I'd say there was some definitely probably heavier high school and, and secondary, but there were some elementary students with parents kind of assisting them as well. Um, and their questions, you know, we did several forms that week, two for parents, um, four for staff, and the student form as well. And, um, you know, we did get those questions answered and, and certainly took into account there are a couple of things mentioned there that um, are still a part of our plan. There's, you know, one idea about just, you know, putting out some information to students as they come back to school about, you know, isolating and, you know, trying to safely quarantine, you know, not, not a requirement, but a best practice to, you know, to start thinking about that you're coming back to school and to start being safe and responsible. So that's something that we, you know, we will share out in the coming weeks as well. So I thought that was a great suggestion that came from a student um, during that forum. And I've actually used it in several areas when I've talked about it. So it's been great. Great. Any other comments? Well, Shivy and Sophia, you are welcome to stay as long as you like. I think it'd be great, you know, if you're here for the reopening discussion and maybe even a way in on the daily schedule if you want. Um, we try to put things that might be of the most importance to you guys at the front of the schedule. So we'll move on and we'll go to continued business. And judging from the fact that we have people here, I assume most people are here about the reopening update. And so I'll turn it over to Dr. Daly to talk about school reopening. Great. Thank you so much. So, you know, at this time we have submitted our plan to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. They are currently reviewing plans, but um, I believe, you know, based upon the no news is good news from our original submission that from July, um, earlier in July, that we are there, we are well on, on track. And I believe, you know, as I've, I've shared in the past, I think uh, North Reading was around that time in the governor's new map we were unshaded now we're in green but communities that are in white and green uh certainly can be looking at in-person and hybrid and i i'm fully confident that you know all the powers that be support our decision to open in hybrid i think we've come up with a model that is um, five days a week there's some slight changes when we talk about the schedule changes to accommodate all the different aspects that we need to incorporate through negotiations um, but those those changes to the schedule are going to allow for teachers to be fully prepared to deliver remote instruction in a way that they've never done before and in-person instruction in a way they've never done before and the combination of those two ideas in a hybrid model. Um, we've been very hard at work in our negotiation group. Um, we've been meeting virtually with our uh, NREA representatives as well as uh, members of the school committee, administrators. It has been uh, very, very productive, and I think that um, there's, there's a great amount of trust. I actually, you know, I sent an email out to some of the former superintendents just to thank them for the work they did and, you know, hiring some great people and setting up just an incredible um, trust in this community. I think the parents and the teachers and the administrators work so well together to come up with a plan that it really works well. And I think, you know, the, the taxpayers that have contributed to our newer schools and the upkeep and the capital projects that have maintained our, our older schools, um, we, we've really come up with some great ideas and some great answers to the questions that are, that are really challenging a lot of districts. I know, you know, the building I grew up in um, as a student, you know, is, is 100 years old and there's ventilation issues and there's, you know, all kinds of issues. This is in another town that, you know, we really don't have some of those issues here quite in the same way. And I think we were able to to really arrive at a very good place um, in our discussions. So, you know, we've been we've been very productive from the outset. We've had good ideas and the, the, the mission that I've been on for the last few weeks at all the forums I've been in is talking about, you know, we, we have a, a concept of universal design in our district. And the idea is design something with all possibilities instead of trying to design something and then doing a lot of aftermarket parts and aftermarket adjustments. So if you design something with remote in mind and you design a really good remote model, then you think about, well, if I, what's the hardest part about remote, right? The hardest part about remote is 
I don't have the students in front of me to do all those things that you can only do when you're in front. And to me, that's if we view it that way, that's the beauty of the hybrid model. We're designing a really brilliant remote model so that students get the courses that they wanted from the teachers that are most passionate about teaching them. We design that in a remote model. And then on top of that, a few days a week, you get to be in person with some of your students to be able to fill in those gaps, to see those faces, to answer those questions, and to, and to support them as needed. And I think if we approach things that way, there's going to be a lot of learning and a lot of support for our teachers in those 10 days and then also in the collaboration periods that are built into our schedule to support that challenge of, okay, how do I both teach students remotely and in person during the course of a day? And there's a lot of different ways to approach that. And that's really our next mission is making sure that we're, we're able to do that well. But what this allows us to do is if, um, you know, again, students who are home, whether they're choosing to be home in cohort D or whether they're home because of the, the uh, you know, the rotation of the cohorts A and B, they're able to still partake in their typical classes in the courses they would have typically been in. If we do have to pivot into a full remote, then it's the same courses, the same teachers, and all that work that we've done into designing really great remote lessons is still going to work. So I think that that's what set us up for success right now. We have um, some of those logistical things worked out. The real challenge now is, is supporting our teachers to make sure that um, they have the, the tools that they need, the supports that they need to work with students both in front of them and remotely. So that's really the biggest uh, pieces that are out there. There's a lot of new information coming every day. There's new information about sports, and I think we'll talk about that a little bit tonight, um, about the question of participation in sports for students that are remote and for if the district is in full remote. Some things we can discuss, some things that we certainly still need information on. Um, the cohort letters went out. That was uh, something that was uh, challenging due to some technology, but we got everything out within, within the day um, that we said we would. Some of them came out the next morning, and, and, um, but everyone was notified of their cohorts um, across the district. So you know, I think when you do look at what we've done here in a short amount of time, to identify a model and to let folks know which cohorts they're in, what their class schedules. I know that uh, Shivy mentioned that today. Mr. LaPrette and Mr. Hain were working very hard with their team um, to get those schedules out so the teachers and students can get that sense of um, normalcy, right? What the classes are going to look like, what your schedule looks like. I think that's really um, a good step to be in, um, you know, about, you know, half a month before before our first day of classes. So. I'm sure there are many questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Daly. So for any members of the public that would like to ask questions, you can either ask the question in the chat, and we'll get to those in between discussion. Um, or you can just say you'd like to make a comment or put your name, and we'll call on you. Um, but I'm going to first go around the room to the committee members and see if they have any questions or thoughts they would like to add. Uh, I'll begin with Mr. McGowan, who's been in a lot of these meetings um, with us. Mr. McGowan, any thoughts or questions? Mr. McGowan, you are on mute. Or Sorry, you're not I lost, my, I, I lost my screen. Uh, um, there you go. Uh, I've got 500 things open here. Um, I don't have any questions at the moment. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Imbriano. No, um, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Mrs. Botwell? No questions. Uh, Mr. Papa Vasilio. Chris, are you here? I do see him here, but he's still muted. I will start with my questions and comments quickly. I don't have many questions, just a couple of quick comments. I will jump in. And Chris, if you unmute afterwards, you can jump in. Um, I just want to thank everybody. Um, Mr. McGowan and I and Dr. Daly and uh, uh, Assistant Superintendent Connolly, we've all been part of the negotiations with the teachers union. And I think people hear that we're having negotiations and somebody said to me, well, does that mean they're looking for more money? And I'll just want to be clear up front. We're just talking about trying to create as good of a plan as we can to come back. 
And, you know, we are very, very fortunate to have the leadership that we have in this district. We've talked a lot about Dr. Daly. I think his leadership through this has been great. Um, but I'd also like to recognize a lot of the teachers. There's a number of teachers that have been in the discussions, but in particular, I want to recognize Peter Kane, the head of the union. He's been um, fantastic in trying to, you know, be somebody that teachers can go through, go to with concerns and questions, but also really working, trying to keep the best interests of the students in, in mind as well. And so it's been very good to work with him. Um, we're very fortunate in this community that we've had you know, a lot of support of the community as well. We have new buildings that allows a lot to happen. Um, you know, and, and I just hope people understand that we have created as good of a plan as we can create. And that doesn't, the, the challenge is we can't control everything. There are, if this plan does not go off, it's because of things outside of our control. It's because of, you know, North Reading has an upsurge. I mean, people still have to be vigilant about um, being safe. If we go to a, you know, red, you know, like the, like Dr. Daly was talking about the different levels, um, you know, green, yellow, red. If we end up in, in red, some of these decisions are gonna be taken out of our hands um, by the Board of Health, by the governor, by, you know, other, other entities. And so, you know, we're doing the best we can with what we have and we have to just see, you know, pre-existing conditions and other, other things with our teachers because we need to make sure we have enough people in the building to, you know, actually oversee the plan that we're putting in place. And so those are the, those are my general comments. Um, the couple of questions, I mean, I don't know when Dr. Daly you want to talk about sports, but the other, the other questions I would love to see about, or, or topics I'd like to hear a little bit about, which I know about, but I think is important for the public. We're talking about reopening. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the investments that have been made, particularly with the HVAC system that make sure that everything is safe. Um, you know, with the, with the filters at some schools and with the, uh, systems that we're putting in place for the high school, middle school. Um, and also even, I know this doesn't relate to COVID, but the fact that we still move, we're still in the process of doing the LED lights so that uh, hopefully by the time school is open, every building will have better lighting in place. So I don't know if Dr. Daly or Mr. Connolly could talk about those those uh, changes. Sure, I, I think we'll start with the, with the equipment. Um, you know, I, I just want to start and then I'm gonna hand over to Michael, but. Michael's done a phenomenal job, as you can imagine. I feel very well prepared. I feel like we've um, made some great decisions, very well researched by, by Mr. Connolly. And, you know, he and I have worked closely on this every day, multiple times a day, sharing whatever we hear that's out there, some of the latest and emerging trends. The newer buildings allowed us to do some things um, that, that, were, that were very advantageous to, to you know, a big thing that we did when we looking to spend money, and, and some of this money is coming, of course, from grants that we received. We wanted to do things for the building that, of course, address COVID issues, but are also things that are going to help us moving forward. So anything that we put on there, again, the universal design kind of concept, anything that we can do now that's going to help us for the next 5, 10, 15 years, as opposed to something that is going to be not useful if there's a vaccine, let's say, I think are things that we wanted to invest in. So some of the things that, that we've researched and we've done, I think are going to, to help improve the, the climate and the air quality in all five of our buildings. It's, it looks a little bit different at some of the other buildings um, based upon the systems that were in there. But I just wanted to thank Mr. Connolly for a really phenomenal job. The things that he's going to talk about, I mean, these are things that are state of the art that are going into Mass General, that are going into uh, some of the, the top um, areas um, facilities around around Massachusetts. And so, you know, I think we've done some excellent things here to really support our school. So, Mr. Connolly, can I hand it over to you? Yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Daly. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to address um, some of the, the investments that we have been making this summer, um, all around the HVAC system and um, to certainly improve the, the ventilations within all, all four school buildings. So, um, you know, first and foremost, I just want to also state that I, I think we th we believe that we were in sort of a good good position to begin with, as um, we've been contracted with um, experienced um, licensed HVAC firms um, that are certified to work on the equipment um, at both the high school, middle school, as well as the three elementary schools for the last several years. For the last you know seven eight years, we've um had the this equipment on regular preventative maintenance um schedules with um 
you know, filter changes and, um, you know, belt cleanings and, and return, uh, you know, great cleanings and so forth. So we, we've certainly been working hard to, to upkeep, um, the, you know, the status of these buildings and, and addressing any issues, not letting anything kind of slide or, or build up, um, you know, over the last several years. And some of the things that Dr. Daly just alluded to, um, based on the research that we have done, based on some of the recommended guidelines by some of the engineering firms that have done presentations to um, facilities directors across the state, uh, we have certainly listened to those and, and done our own research. And, and, and um, I'll start with the middle school and the high school. Uh, we are making, um, you know, a pretty large investment to install, uh, you know, an air purifying system known as, you know, certainly like an ionizing purifying system in the actual air handlers and duct work, um, you know, right, right from the, you know, the start of the ventilation process. So these are, this is sort of the latest and greatest technology that has Dr. Daly alluded to earlier as is going in medical buildings, going into large commercial buildings, going into large uh, college and universities and so forth that are investing in this type of technology. So we, we have um, opted to make this investment and uh, the results of such that we have seen um, of such of a purifying system ha are, are really just incredible and it's, it's able to certainly, uh, you know, filter out and, and kill just all pathogens and, and viruses of, of this nature um, right, right from the outset. So you know, we, we feel that we've we certainly put put the, the high school, middle school in a, in a very good um, position to in terms of uh, our HVAC system and the ventilation. Um, in terms of the bachelor elementary school, which also has a similar system in, in, in a sense that it's the ventilation is handled through the air handlers and through duct work. Um, we have also made um, the investment to install such a system and on the six air handlers um, on the roof to, you know, further purify the air before it even gets to the filters, which we are which we are upgrading as well. And then the the older buildings, the hood and the little school, which are essentially um, the ventilation system is handled through uh, unit ventilators that are in the classrooms and in the offices and in the buildings. We are upgrading all of those those air handling. Um, I'm sorry, the, the unit ventilators in each room to the the MERV 13 filter, which is the recommended filter to catch you know pathogens and viruses of of this nature, um, and that that's what engineering firms have have recommended. So we are in the process of of doing that, and we also have had our service companies and out to further perform the the maintenance and the and the, to replace the belts and to clean clean motors and in some cases replace motors just to, to make sure everything is functioning um and we're going to continue to to be be going through this process um over the next couple of weeks so as dr daly mentioned i think we've we've certainly made the investment we've certainly taken um you know we think a pretty sound approach in, in ensuring that the buildings are as, are as safe as, as possible and, and the ventilation system is really top, top notch. Um, Thank so, you, Mr. Great. Sorry. Yeah, so, so I think fair to say, um, and there are a couple questions on this, but I think fair to say, you know, there were, there were some minimum things that were, that were required or requested. Um, and in every case, we've at least met those and where possible, there were even you know, there were there were better systems that we could install and we did. So we didn't try to take minimum. We tried to look to the future and really put as good a systems in place as we could. Um, and so I think you addressed the first question about older schools um, where like they put new systems in if, they, if possible or the MER filters, if not. Um, uh, maybe Dr. Daly, um, if you want to take the next question, will the bachelor's school still be using the fourth fourth floor and masks, of course? If, uh, if the temperature of the building is hot? I think we'll be adjusting um, whatever spaces yeah. we need if they're not hospitable, but I think yeah, we, I, we, we I can also speak to that. that. Um, so we actually installed our air conditioning on the fourth floor this summer. Um, so the fourth floor 
um, actually should have air conditioning for the opening of school to, to cool down that fourth floor. Um, we've also had uh, companies in there addressing some of the um, issues with some of the windows in the fourth floor to ensure windows, all the windows will be on will be able to be opened and so forth. So we, we've been we've been at work in that area of the building at the bachelor school as well. Excellent, thank you so much, Mr. Connolly. Um, next question is also about the equipment that was installed at the middle high school. Yeah, um, um, so that's a good good question. So I, first I'll just say I don't, you know, we don't really feel, you know, additional equipment was was needed. We, we think, you know, this, you know, every, um, your know, HVAC firm that has come in and, and done service at the middle school and the high school from the outset of the building opened, the first thing they always tell me is that you have the Cadillac of HVAC systems in this building. That, you know, it's a, it's a very um, highly technical, you know, well-designed, highly functioned system that is um, can certainly, um, you know, Certainly, it's it's more advanced than than many of the schools and many of the buildings that they go around in the area and service. So that's always good good thing to hear. Um, so because you know that the middle school and the high school had the ability to for us to even install the, the latest technology that's available um, as an additional precaution, as an additional measure, and in that that we opted to do that and install um, an additional purifying system right in the air handler unit itself, and that. Um, to further filter out and catch you know, pathogens and viruses before it even gets to to the filter level, and and that's what we opted to do. And it was it was a significant investment. The, the middle school and the high school roof has 19 air handlers on that building. As you know, it's a 275 thousand dollars square foot building. Um, the average cost per per uh, equipment was really ranged between four thousand and a little over five thousand dollars a unit for each nineteen uh, air handler units on the rooftop. So we're, we're looking at a little over a hundred thousand dollars investment that we we decided to make. Um, and we certainly have some grant, some one-time use of grant funding. Um, and uh, we we feel based on the research we did um, that it was a, as a sound a sound investment. Um, in we don't feel like it's going to add a lot of you know operating uh, ongoing operating costs to to the district in, in future years. So um, I hope that answers that that next question as well. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and in terms of the air or whatever that's needed, I mean, again, this is something that's been discussed with the teachers, and I think the teachers have been you know very happy with you know looking at what standards are and you know knowing that we're meeting them as you know meeting all the minimums and doing as high as best we can to exceed those um the next question uh dr daly probably about um can you explain a bit more in detail what the teachers teaching in person and remote simultaneously look like sure and this is challenging this is one of those things that i, I understand parents are, are curious to know what this will look like i think our teachers are curious i still haven't met with all of our teachers that's going to happen on september 1st and then it's going to we're going to have 10 days where we're going to go deeper into all of this and to me that's the big the big question is really how how am i going to um, be working both remotely and hybrid with those students that are home right that's sort of the, the essential question that we have to grapple with and that we need some training around but our teachers are going to be well equipped to to think through that model so the easiest way that i would say for for parents and and for teachers as well to think about this is you know if we're doing a full remote model and everyone's home we're not uh, sitting in front of our computers, in front of our screens all day long, right? We're not turning our Chromebook on at 8 o'clock in the morning and then staring at a screen all day while we're, while we're being lectured to um, and then turning the computer off at, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's not what a remote learning day is going to look like um, anywhere in this district. What's going to happen is there's going to be periods where the, you know, synchronous time where the teachers are going to be checking in with students. Now, just like in a regular school day, that may involve a, a teacher-driven lecture. It may be having students watch a video. It may be students coming together in groups to discuss a topic. It may be um, individual time for teachers to check in with questions for extra help. Um, it may be you know, other ways for students to engage with technology to um, socialize and, and to have you know, collaborative group work, sharing Google documents, working on presentations together, using 
uh, virtual manipulatives or doing a lab online. All of those things are possibilities in a remote environment. So the question now becomes, if I'm a teacher in a hybrid, how do I do both at once, right? How do I have kids in front of me and how do I have students at home? And again, as I said earlier tonight, uh, the, the idea that, that what we're doing is we're going to design the best remote lessons and then there's going to be different ways that teachers, and I think it's going to look different for different teachers and look different at different levels for how um, to engage both with the students in front of you and the students at home. Some teachers may choose to, you know, go live from their classroom for a certain period of time and have the students in the classroom hearing something and the, and the teachers um, and the students at home also hearing it at the same time. We are looking at some of the technological limitations there and, and trying to get some microphones so that um, the, the devices that we're broadcasting from can pick, can pick up the sound of the teacher and also some of the questions that might come within a classroom. So that's one idea. Another idea, and, and there are some that may not want to do that at all. Some may prefer to do something like every student watches uh, a pre-recorded lecture or reads an assignment and then we come together and we have the discussion together. Um, all the students in the classroom might have Chromebooks, all the students at home might have Chromebooks. So there's going to be ways to interact virtually with, with classmates as well as with the teacher um, throughout the class. There may be other situations where the teacher is going to do it just like the teacher would do with um, small groups. Very often, if you walk into a, a regular in-person classroom, let's go back to last, last September, you would see a teacher um, starting off a lesson, but then working with one group over here and another group over there and a, a third group in a third place. And maybe there's other adults in the room um, that might be working with the group um, and helping out so that the different groups can be managed. I, I see this more at the elementary level. And so I think what you might see even with the virtual environment is the teacher may have another adult in the building being utilized to help out with the group in front of them in the classroom live while the teacher makes time to go over and communicate with some of the students remotely. So this is one of the major topics um, that we're going to be looking at and discussing through all of our collaboration on the 10 days that our teachers have as well as the collaboration periods that are going to be built into um, every week for the teachers to continue to answer this question. It's not an easy question. It's something that we're going to learn, but I think any job, if you know, whatever job we do, if you gave me 10 days of professional development, I'm going to be in a lot better place at the end of that to really provide some very thorough um, responses. And the, the challenge of, you know, how do I teach students in front of me and students remotely, that's a technical challenge. And I would, you know, my, my wager is that I would much rather have my teachers teaching in subjects that they're passionate about to students getting their first choices in their electives or their top choices in their electives rather than coming up with some other kind of model that that reuses teachers and has multiple sections of math and then we're, we're not able to offer a music elective or something so I, I think our model the students are following the same schedule they would if they're in person and the challenge is the teacher is trying to come up with um, ways to do it remotely and again we think about designing it remotely and then we adapt and adjust to do that in hybrid. And I think that's the, uh, the approach we're taking and it seems to be um, working for us so far. Thank you, Dr. Daly. I would just, I would just add that like we've said a couple of times and you said a couple of times here, there's going to be professional development days. The reason we're building in collaboration is we understand that there's going to be a lot that has to be worked on throughout. And, you know, we're having lots of time talking to the teachers union about, you know, their thoughts on all of this as well. And so, you know, we're really trying to support everyone in making these decisions. Um, next question, Dr. Daly or, or Michael about um, the status of the Chromebooks. I believe I know sure. the answer. But right. answer. So we I, have, um, there might have been one question just before that, Mr. Buckley, you don't mind about uh, maybe one final HVAC question there that I'll just try to address quickly. Um, so there is a question about the, the fresh air intake and, and so forth. And uh, that it that certainly was part of the, the DSE recommended guidelines to to look at the the level of fresh and in, air intake, and we have certainly are also in the process of of doing that. And the plan is certainly to increase the the fresh air intake percentage rates while also expanding the occupancy schedules, you know, r running the systems longer to continue to improve airflow and ventilation. So that's something that we're also doing as well in regards to the the HVAC systems. Thank you. And Dr. Daly, Chromebooks? So we do have uh, some of the Chromebooks in. We started ordering things uh, way back in the spring. 
So I know that we have several grade levels that are being set up right now. We then have other devices that will be going out to other students. Our hope is that we are able to get all the devices into students' hands by uh, the start of school. It might take a little bit of time um, for, for some of the younger students in the elementary grades. So we've got rollouts scheduled for grade 7, as we always do in the summer, also for grade 6. And I believe we're scheduling grade 5 soon. Um, and then grades K to 4, there, there is about 400 students who already have a device that was issued last spring. And so between those devices that have been issued and other devices that we have in district, we're going to have a slightly different rollout process for those devices as well. So, but all students are going to be getting um, Chromebooks near the beginning of school. So there are backups. Some of the order, we do have some orders that are still out there um, that we know might be delayed into October. Um, but we are still feeling that we're going to be able to get out um, the devices that we have in district. And again, so that some of these devices are not brand new, but they are um, still very high quality. They're within a couple of years. Um, and so basically what we've realized is all these devices that we bought new in the last year or so for the schools that are used as a part of the carts, we don't really need them if we have one-to-one uh, -one devices. So we're going to all the schools and taking those carts and redistributing those devices to individual students to be able to use for remote learning. So our plan is to have those within the first few weeks of school in everyone's hand. It'll be a slightly different rollout process for the younger grades. And obviously developmentally, um, we have to talk about how we, how we do that process, right? We can't just hand um, kindergarten or Chromebook and, and have them walk out the door with it the same way you can do it with a seventh grader or a high schooler. So we're going to have some appropriate uh, distribution points. But the distribution process itself um, is very thoughtfully done by Dr. Downs. It is something that takes some time. So we, we're going to find that sweet spot between getting it out, getting it done well and smoothly, and also getting stuff in people's hands to begin the year. So we, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of ideas in place for that. Great. You want to you just go on with the next questions, Dr. Daly, since they're all for you? <laughs> um, let's see. I think the next one was about the days. starting a first grade. Is there any update on this? So at, at this time, we are still doing um, kindergarten five days a week. We are trying to figure out about first grade. I do not believe that we're going to be able to start the school year with kindergarten, with first grade in, in every day. What the elementary principals who are, who are really trying to look at this every day, um, that we need to look and see what, what it looks like and how everything flows um, those first few days of school before we can make any decisions about additional space. And there's just a lot of challenges logistically to bringing in um, more, more classes and more grades. But it is certainly on our radar, and if we're able to do it, and if we're able to get more time with students, we would start with those youngest learners, so we would go from kindergarten to grade one. Um, how will assessments take place? Is this in the works? So I'm trying to, I'm not exactly sure what, um, what we're thinking of here in terms of assessment, but if we're thinking about uh, grades and testing at different schools, um, I think there's all different plans for doing that. You know, all, all of the typical assessments we would do, there, there are a lot of technological tools to prevent cheating and to monitor, um, you know, proper assessments. So even if a student is home, they should be able to take an assessment in a safe way um, and, and a, you know, in a secure setting. And so I think that we'll be doing that. We're also going to be thinking about and talking about as a part of our professional development, how are we doing those baseline assessments to see where the students are, what kind of interventions are needed so that we can accelerate the learning for possible gaps from where students were from last spring. So that is, that is a large part of um, the conversation that we're having with our teachers in the, in the coming, in the very near future. Um, and, and as we said to start the meeting to take this next question, um, the negotiations with the teachers have been excellent. They're very receptive to the hybrid model. Um, they shared with us their survey data that, that said what percentage of teachers were comfortable with the hybrid model. And that is um, where we are today. So we have, you know, reached a place where we feel that we have done everything, you know, both the district and the teachers have come together to come up with a plan to follow a schedule for a hybrid model. As Mr. Buckley said earlier, there are things that are still out there to be realistic that, you know, trending numbers in, in with COVID and, you know, some other factors that might be beyond our control. But everything to date that I've seen has us working toward being able to return as scheduled 
um, on September 17th. Um, will the students be able to go from class to class for special? So, you know, this is all uh, in our reopening plan. At the high school level, the students are switching classes in the elementary and middle school. They are staying in one place and um, the, the specialist and the others are coming into the classroom. Middle school may have a few breakouts. High school is going to have full breakouts um, where they're going to follow their schedule as, as typical. Um, walkthroughs for incoming middle school students and parents. There will be walkthroughs for the students. One thing that's going to be different at all levels is there's going to be less access to the buildings for parents. And so, you know, you can understand the reasons why. Uh, so certainly at the middle school level, we're aware of, um, especially at grade six, but honestly, for all students to have um, that ability to come to school and to see not only the building that they're familiar with, but how it looks a little bit different. There might be a different entrance that students are coming in. There may be a different one way in the street, um, you know, in the hallway um, that's pointing them that way so they can get a sense of the school. So our plan is on the 14th, 15th, and 16th to have individual grade levels coming in and small groups and getting to experience those walkthroughs. But we will not be having parents coming through with the students at this time just to, because we're limiting the amount of um, folks outside, you know, parents that are coming into the buildings. So that is a bit of a shift. And I think it's one that's just necessary for health and safety reasons this year. Does a student who already has a Chromebook need to borrow one from the school? Um, all students will be issued a district Chromebook. So if you have a personal Chromebook, you still will be getting a district issued one. And there's many reasons for that, but we can ensure what's on the, the devices that we're using. We can ensure that uh, when those devices are in school, this is the, the thinking behind our entire one-to-one -one program. When we start allowing students to bring their own devices into the building, now we're troubleshooting all different brands, software updates, a million different um, variables and factors for our tech team to, to contend with. By having um, the district issued device, that makes the most sense for us. We can safely, securely make sure that it's up to code, that it's following all the um, Child Internet Protection Act uh, requirements, and also just compatibility with our network. All those things are already hardwired and programmed in to the devices. So students who already have their own Chromebook can use something at home, but you know we we suggest that they're working on schoolwork that they're using the district issued device. Excellent. Thank you so much. If there's any more questions, you can type them in. I think right now we're going to move on to the new business, which is a similar topic here, which is the school daily schedule. And so Dr. Daly, do you want to talk about the uh, schedule? Sure. I, did you want me to mention about sports, Mr. Buckley? You'd asked me that earlier as well. Yeah, you would mention. I didn't know if we had much of an update there. Yeah, I would just I would just say for us to consider, and I, I just I want to make sure that I've said my person. Well, you know, the district's recommendation um, for students who are um, choosing full remote that they be allowed to participate in sports if they so choose. I could see a scenario where a parent feels um, unsafe to send the child back to school in inside but feels that you know outside cross country is is okay and they want their child to participate so that's something the committee can discuss but the district's recommendation would be that we would allow those students to participate in sports that they're being held i think we also need to discuss what participation looks like for the district if we are in full remote so is the entire district in full remote and then we may differentiate that between whether in full remote for some logistical reason or if we're in full remote because of um a positivity outbreak you know in the town that puts us in the quote unquote red so i don't know whether the the committee wants to discuss that at all tonight not necessarily vote but just discuss um well why don't we, why don't we finish the questions go through the schedule then we can talk a little bit about that um sure. you know just just to make sure that we get through um these topics and there are a couple of other questions uh dr daly if you want to go through about freshman mentors sure um I will have to, I, I assume that we are going to have uh, some program for the, for the SLAM program for the freshmen. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that looks like and how that works. I will have to check with Mr. LaPred on that, but I'm sure that we can uh, get a response to that and make sure we communicate something out soon. But that is a great program that we, 
we value, and I'm sure that we're going to find a way to do that in some way, shape, or form. But I'm sure it's going to look a little bit different this year, just like everything else. Um, and elementary students taking a break from not using Chromebooks when they're in person? Absolutely. We, we, we do not use our one-to-one -one devices all day long, but they are there when we need them. And um, that, is, that is the advice. We want these devices so that students can engage at home without worry about uh, not having a device. We certainly saw in our surveys that parents that even had an iPad or two or a computer at home, they felt that um, once we got into remote learning and now every child's on the computer and every child has a, a Google Hangout with their teacher, that you know the, the shared device wasn't enough. So that's why we're doing one-to-one. -one. One one-to-one does not mean that you are uh, on a Chromebook or looking at a screen all day long. We know the value um, of face-to-face of -face interaction. That's why we're in hybrid and not doing full remote. And we also know the, the pitfalls of too much screen time. So we're definitely going to avoid that as well. So I'm going to share the schedule, um, Mr. Buckley, with you and just explain a little bit about what this looks like. So this year, as you are aware, there are um, restrictions on time and learning. And those time and learning restrictions um, have been modified as the schedule allowed for teachers to have an additional 10 days of training and professional development at the start of the year. So that the required number of days for students went from 100 and 180 down to 170. And the number of hours went to 850 for elementary schools and 935 hours for secondary schools. And so through the negotiation process, we talked about what were some of the things that we needed, what were some of the things that were very important to us. As Mr. Buckley alluded to earlier, you know, the, there are certain things that are subject to bargaining, and, and some of those would be changes to working conditions associated with just about anything that's happening this year with, with all these changes associated with COVID. So one thing that was very uh, clear from the teachers was that worked well in the spring as they adjusted to a totally different way of teaching. Um, is, is to have time for collaboration, grade level planning, in order to deliver the best options for, for learning. And so what we've done um, on our side is we've allowed some time for collaboration for the teachers. And then we've also allowed for additional needs that may be beyond what we typically have in a school year, which is where teachers are there to receive students. Students aren't going to be able to just come in to a building at the middle high school and congregate in Main Street two, 300 students at a time um, before they get into classes. Students who need to come in you know, separate doors, they're gonna need to go right to rooms, they're gonna to need to be supervised. So we had to reallocate the minutes and the schedule a little bit. And so essentially this is what this looks like. We played with a few different um, ideas to get to where we needed to get to. And we also had to take into consideration the, the, the school committee's goal, which was to have students in school five days a week. Um, and that's something we were able to preserve through this schedule. Um, we had to take into account when to, to schedule the different events, how the buses were going to work, how the pickups and drop-offs were going to work, and also athletics and extracurriculars at the secondary level. So there were many different things that we had to factor into place. And to think about when that collaboration time was going to be most effective and most useful um, for our teachers. And part of what came out of this conversation was a flipping of the start times with the middle school and the high school going later and the elementary schools going earlier. We worked really hard at this to not make the shift as dramatic as it would be in a typical school year um, because of that extra time that's already been taken off for some of the collaboration. The earliest that we're asking an elementary school to start is 745, which is, which is later than our typical start time for the high school, which is 730. So, it's, it's still earlier for the elementary age kids, but it is a little bit later. And as a secondary um, you know, output of this, which is not a major driver, but it's certainly something we've been exploring as a district, it will give us a glimpse into something that a lot of the surveys um, came back from students and parents at the secondary level, especially supporting the later start times for the teenagers. There's a lot of science and research that we've been looking at as a district to support that. So that, that is not a major driver of this, but it was uh, an outcome of this that we were able to support. So teachers are arriving in the morning. They're at the middle school and the high school. They're providing their teacher collaboration. Everyone is doing student arrival and extra help time. The student days, the student start and end times are established. And then there's 
other time where the staff are assisting with student dismissal and providing extra help. All these things are in the contract and all these things needed some discussion around, um, around when those uh, times would be established. And as you can see, we're within our times on these days, um, each day to get us to the number of minutes that we need for the year. Wednesdays was a little bit different. And part of this was how do we come up with um, the collaboration schedules that would work for elementary teachers? So it's a little bit different. So on Wednesdays, we're doing an, a, a release for all of our students um, in grades K through 12. And they will be released at 1115 at the Batchelor and 1135 at the Hood and the Little School. That allows us to then have teacher collaboration and lunchtime um, together on Wednesdays at those schools. The high school and middle schools will continue with their same schedule that they would have on a typical day on a Wednesday. So it's a different schedule for the elementary, which then allows for them to have their collaboration periods um, on those Wednesday afternoons. And it allowed for an equitable balance of minutes between the, the elementary and the middle high school, about as close as we could get it. And this is the schedule that, that was shared out with the community um, last week. We wanted to give folks as much of a heads up as possible about some of these shifts in time. One thing that we're really trying to look to adjust are the um, before and after school care for the, for the elementary school. So we're, we're very much aware that some folks' schedules might be planned around the, the elementary start, uh, the elementary end times being closer to 3 o'clock. 2.45 and 3 o'clock as opposed to uh, 2 o'clock and 2.20. And so we're going to, per, to extend our very affordable um, before school ch child care to also have aspects of after school child care. So going until that time around 3 o'clock when those days would end, we will have some very affordable um, child care options for those parents whose schedules typically would have students in school till 3. In addition to that, we will also have our YMCA program, which would run as typical from 3 until um, about 5 p.m., I believe, is what our plan is for this year. So much more coming on those as well. So all of these plans, when you do the math out, that we hit our time and learning hours just, just barely. So this allows for the, it's sort of the maximum amount of collaboration that we can allow our teachers to get them prepared to teach remotely every day. Um, and it also gets us our, our time on learning hours from the state. Um, it allows the shifts in the starting time allow for all the buses to arrive at each school on time and for all interested students to take the bus. So it's very difficult with the number of buses that we have and the, and the, the number of students that are allowed to ride the bus. We needed to make some adjustments to all those times to make sure we were able to, to get our buses where they need to be and to allow some time, obviously, for um, the dismissal of students and the arrival of students being a little bit different process, especially in the beginning of this year. We're going to have, it's going to be a bit of a learning curve, but we built in some extra time there so that we're not cutting it too close. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that those bus pickup times at elementary are early, but not earlier than 7 a.m. This is not a ridiculously early schedule um, that, you know, many of our students are coming to the before school program already at that time. And so it's, you know, I think Mr. McGowan checked the, uh, the almanac and it's still, um, it's always going to be light out at that time, which I know is a concern um, with before school uh, start time starting too early. So that's something we, we really checked into. Um, I think I mentioned about the before and after school care, um, the later start times that the, agrees with the science and the research is a nice outcome of this. Um, the schedule will remain the same, whether in remote or in person. So the exception to this is, the Batchelder School may follow the same hours so that all the three elementary schools are in person. That's something that Mr. Clean would work with the school community, the staff, and the parents to decide. But um, we, we don't want to have too many variables. We don't have one schedule for remote, one schedule for in person, you know, and everyone wondering what schedule we're on. So the only thing that may change is if we're in full remote for an extended period of time due to some um, cause that we um, adjust that elementary start time for the batch elders so that they are on the same schedule. Right now, the busing, uh, the batch just has more students, and that's why we need the buses at that building to be on that schedule. If we were in remote, we would not need that, and we could adjust those times. And then finally, the, um, the pre-K the pre schedules is another uh, driver in this. We had to factor in when those pre-K pre students are coming to school, when they're being picked up, 
when we're doing the cleaning because we're doing an AM and a PM session, we have to clean in between. And so that was another factor, another driver for starting the elementary schools earlier and then having no interference then with what we had to do with the drop off, pick up and cleaning for the pre-K. So are there any questions? Hi, okay. I think we have one question in there already, Dr. Daly about middle school and I would say high school as well, about early arrival if, if parents need. Yes, that, that is something we are looking at is, is some kind of program for middle school that would be before school care. I believe, Mr. Connolly, is that something we're, we're talking about putting out? Yes, Dr. Daly, it's something that we've certainly discussed and um, it's something that we're going to look at because we realize we've certainly adjusted those those hours there as well. So it's it's something we're going to we're certainly looking at. Absolutely. And for high school students, we do hope that they take advantage and, and sleep a little bit later as opposed to, you know, practicing more in the morning or getting up earlier. I mean, I, we, we, we are going to be putting out some more information to try to support our students in in getting the proper sleep that they need. And I, and I, I would just emphasize two things that you said in there, Dr. Daly. The, the, the one is that by allowing the collaboration time, the high school, middle school is going to start later anyway. So there was going to have to be some sort of adjustment because with busing, you can't push those days back into the same opening time as elementary. And so it just made sense in many people's minds to flip the flip the schedules at that point in time. At least, at least that's how I thought about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing just to point out was, you know, there is, there's different, like the before school programs at elementary used to be, as you said, very, very, very affordable. It wasn't like the after school live program, which is a longer period of time. And so I appreciate the administration's efforts to try to have the same sort of program right after school for a short period of time. If, you know, three o'clock was okay, but two, two or 220 wasn't, was too early for somebody. Um, but then also offering the additional later time, that, you know, up to six o'clock. So I don't know if committee members have, I know there's some other questions coming in, but I want to just quickly go to the committee as well um, and see if anybody else has thoughts on it. Mr. McGowan, do you have any thoughts or comments? Uh, yeah, thanks. I Just a, a quick comment on, on the early, on the bachelor schedule. Um, Dr. Daly mentioned this is something I always have my eye on, maybe because every year I'm always tracking exactly when sunrise uh, is, because it always seems like it takes forever to get early once it's late. But anyway, uh, if we are fortunate enough to be continuing in the hybrid model in December, the latest uh, the latest the, the sunrise happens is at 714, but of course there's dawn before then, so it should be light out anytime after 7, uh, and I know that uh, uh, you all are working on keeping those bus uh, routes you know, as tight as possible, but um, so I, I really do think that'll work around. And, and as I say, if we if we are actually in the hybrid model in December, that'll be a high class problem, as, as someone once said. So um, overall, I think um, this schedule makes sense. I know it's a big change for a lot of people, and, and hopefully they'll be able to adapt. Hey, thank you. Mrs. Imbriano texted me to say she has no questions. Uh, Chris, any questions? Um, no, I'm, I'm good at the moment. All right. And Diana, any questions, Mrs. Butwell? No, I just, um, you know, I wish we could have saw this and, and talked about it before it got distributed to the entire district. So I feel like the vote is a little bit of a moot point. Yeah, and and and, and I, w I will say that like, you know, uh, Mr. McGowan and I were both in the negotiations with the NREA and that's part of what came up and I apologize we didn't send it up to you beforehand um, on that one. It was just a lot of things happening at the same time. And so, you know, but we did have two school committee members that were on that committee talking about it. And, you know, for everything that came up, it seemed to make the most sense to do that this year. Um, but, you know, I apologize I, if it's up to you guys. I, I agree. And, and I feel the same way. We, we should have socialized it at least, but uh, it just it just got, you know, just slipped. We just didn't think of it. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if we even needed to vote on it since it was already a decision that needed to be made, not so much, you know, who needs to know when and at what point. Um, you know, I, I do think that the batch elder time is is tough. Um, and I wish we could have got a little bit more input on that. But again, that's just my own personal opinion. But I understand the reasonings. 
Okay, thank you very much. And then there are a couple of questions, I think. Um, uh, Dr. Daly connected to the four school at middle school. My daughter drives to school with high schooler. Wait. <clears throat> I don't know the question here. Connected to before school. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. yeah, if you typically have a high schooler driving now, the high school is later than the middle school. The the middle school student would need to, if they're going to come earlier, then they would need to. Um, yeah, so I, yeah. I guess the high schooler would have to wait outside until the middle schooler is. Um, you know, if the the high schooler would drive the middle schooler, the middle schooler would go into school, and the high schooler would then coming to school a few minutes later. You know, we, we really can't be receiving the high school students um, any earlier than, than when they're supposed to be coming in. So it, in this case, the high school student would be getting there at 8.30. The middle schooler would be getting there a little bit later. And right. so, so the issue is, the issue goes back to the, know, the need for the and we, before and we school. And talk about it, that we're yeah. trying to get some kind of yeah. before school way for middle schoolers to get there early. Yeah. So I, I think we definitely hear that need and we'll certainly be continuing our discussions on how to make that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, and then the Wednesday true half day for elementary. Yes, it is. So again, we our, our goal there was to preserve the five days a week. And we did that, but it is going to be a half day on the Wednesdays that would include kindergarten as well. Full, so full day K, and we've had a separate form with kindergarten to, to answer this question in detail. But even the full day programs um, would be half day. And it's not. Uh, to my knowledge, and I, I will verify this with all the elementary principals when we meet this week, but I don't think there's an expectation of remote learning. That that time is now, that's when the elementary teachers are collaborating and that's what they're doing. They're not engaging. So I think that the students have the afternoon to, um, to do what they need to do in the afternoon. It's not an expectation that they're, um, you know, there, there may be quote unquote homework or whatever is assigned to elementary students that they could be doing, but it's not that they're engaged um, in the afternoon in remote learning. That's, that is not my understanding of the plan. Yeah. And, and the elementary just thought it would be better to have their, um, their collaboration time all one day, one block, as opposed to the high school, middle school, which wanted it spread over five days. Um, can I, can I, I ask, uh, Mr. Buckley, excuse me. Can I just ask Dr. Daly, um, what feedback you've received directly from the community on the schedule, if any? Um, I've received some, uh, feedback, you know, I think it's been a mix of, um, you know, positives about the, they, they like some of the benefits of the later start times. They like the, you know, the teachers certainly have expressed that they are very happy to see there's time built in for collaboration. I think the, you know, the agreement is that we, you know, we didn't have all day Wednesday to be doing this, but it's built in, you know, there's time built in every week. I think the fact that it's equitable makes a lot of sense. There certainly was some feedback about, you know, the earlier start times and certainly just the, you know, the way it came out. And it was that that sweet spot about wanting to communicate it very soon to parents who were asking and to make sure they had about a month before the first day of school to be aware of these changes in start times so they could make adjustments as needed. Um, and then also taking the time to get you know, to vet it, to get it approved, voted on and everything. So, you know, I know what the committee came out with that day was to, you know, to, to, to have me send it out to, to make sure that it was on people's radars. Um, and I think that that's what some of the feedback is, but, but honestly, not a ton of, of uh, feedback that we've received about it. Um, you know, there, there were certainly people that were, you know, on both sides um, about it and there's pros and cons to every thing that we do, but I think it's, um, you know, I think it's something that we can certainly move on with. And it, again, I was, I agree that the, the, the batch times especially are early, but when I saw that it was 745, it's, it's not, it's not like we're starting at 715, like I've seen in, in other districts with, with that kind of a situation. So it's still, you know, it's, it's much closer to eight o'clock and I was much more comfortable when I saw it getting to 745. Um, and I think it's, you know, people are, are making all kinds of adjustments for this year. And I feel like, this is one that people are willing to accept. And I think the parents of the community overall see the value in, in the five days a week and in the consistent schedule and are willing to, um, to grapple with some of the difficulties of that schedule change. Yeah. And this, and again, to emphasize, this is one year, this is not a permanent change. We'll see how it goes, but 
you know, Mrs. Cronin commented she hopes it is a permanent change. And I think we've been looking at that and, you know, I think many people agree, but for now, this is one year we're talking about. Um, Dr. Daly, yes, I believe there will still be aftercare on Wednesdays for elementary, correct? There will. <laughs> so we're working on what that looks like um, with the YMCA. So that might be a little bit different. Um, there's not going to be the the aftercare from 11.15 to 3 o'clock that I described before um, on Wednesdays, but there will be an option for people to do the YMCA program for an extended period of time on those days. Uh, so then, we're working on all that now. We've been in meetings just about every day with the Y, who's been a great partner. Also with the Recreation Department, talking about possible remote learning assistance. Um, we, we are exploring every possibility. Um, and, and I want to thank Lynn Clemens, Maureen Stevens, and, and everyone in town working with the Board of Health, trying to come up with you know what what venues in town can we possibly have some sites uh, where we could host there's certainly a demand from the parents and we want to be able to try and help as many parents as we can working parents um, with a focus I think on elementary age students especially um, to try and get some support on those days when we are um, you know when students are in the remote so the YMCA and the uh, rec department have been great partners in those conversations uh, the next question High school students, I believe, receive their schedules today. Um, middle school and elementary are, are coming soon. I know that we're working on some of those, those details. The cohort assignments all went out. And from there now, we're just making sure we're sorting out our classes and our schedules and making sure that everything works. So middle school and elementary are, are forthcoming. I can remind the principals to give you an update about the timelines for those. But I believe high school went out today. And then do you want to clarify a little bit more? So <clears throat> the, the, the Wednesday, <clears throat> I think I think the point for uh, Mrs. Brewster was that since we moved the elementary start time a little bit earlier, we understood some people used to have care only till, you know, till about, or had care starting at three o'clock. And so for days where school gets out a little bit earlier at two o'clock or 2.20, um, we'll try to have an earlier option available, uh, a cheaper option available just to three o'clock. And then an extended day from three to six o'clock on Wednesday, since you know it, it would be just the YMCA program, which would be the typically it'd be three to six, but it would be eleven fifteen to six o'clock um, on Wednesdays, if I'm understanding you correct. Yeah, that is that is correct, Mr. Buckley. And we're going to have we're working right now to have much more clear documentation in writing that kind of explains these uh, these programs everyone. But basically. For the Wednesdays at elementary, everybody knows that everyone's getting out at the same, you know, everyone's getting out at their early dismissal time. And that's a little different than um, that being a result of the earlier start times. So, so I, I only have one question, which is somewhat schedule related, but, um, and I, I think I know the answer is, again, but I think it's important to point out um, in terms of snow days, since we are in a hybrid model or maybe going to remote, is the goal not to have snow days this year if there is a reason that people have to stay home? That's correct. The goal is to try to avoid snow days if possible. Um, but if there is a major, let's say, major power outage or there's something that's preventing us from safely um, connecting or, or even um, productively engaging remotely, um, that might be a, a reason that, that doesn't count as a school day. But I think if we develop this remote model and we're doing it just about all year long, then it's just a day where everybody's in remote. And I think for the most part, we can think about not having the snow days and getting out a little bit earlier in June. And, and I guess on a similar note, I would say <clears throat> we are still planning on having vacations um, at, at this point in time. And uh, for half days, is there any, any been any discussion about those? So, well, the half days are to be determined. Um, the full days are still in the schedule as planned, and I think we're going to um, continue to revisit that. I, I really, I, I hate to say it this way, but I really think we need to get into the school year a little bit just to see how it's going, to see how that collaboration time is going, to make a, a decision about whether do we need a break, do we need a half day for some more time, or are we, are we you know, gaining momentum? Because every time we do a half day now, that would that would mean that um, a cohort might lose 
part of their instructional time or their in-person time. And I think we want to make sure those are really well balanced. So typically our half days are all scheduled on the Fridays. So even if we keep them, we might move some of the days around just to try to balance that out as much as possible. So I would imagine that some of those half days for collaboration may be um, relinquished this year because we have the collaboration built into the teacher schedules already on a daily or weekly basis at elementary. So that's my thought right now, but I'm still keeping them in there right now with the TBD designation. Um, and we'll give everyone notice ahead of those days whether they're happening. I think the first one that we had scheduled for the 25th of September, we are we are not having that this year. I think I even removed that on the calendar already because we're not going to have one in the second week of school. And then the other question was what I was just going to ask when you said that as well about, so there's a lot of holidays on Mondays. Will that also be something that we address in so, terms of... Yeah. The final weekly schedule is something that we're hoping to come out with at the end of this week. Um, I think the high school needs to drive this a little bit, if I'm not mistaken, because their schedule dictates um, the most change with their green gold days. And so they are going to balance the, the green gold opportunities. So there may not be, it may not be every other week. It's, it's going to be a balance between the A's and the B's going three days versus two days. So yes, we're going to take into account the Monday holidays so that um, there's an equal balance. And, and our, our teachers have been fantastic with this and our curriculum leaders kind of emailing, they've kind of done the whole metric of the year and calculated how many times they see each student, each cohort on a green day or a gold day. And so from there, we then need to determine the middle school and the elementary schedules, which are less um, dependent upon um, you know, different classes on different days. So that should all be coming up pretty soon, but we're going to try and achieve a balance. And Dr. Daly has also decided that there will only be snow on Thursdays and Fridays, so that'll help balance it out for us. Exactly. Um, okay. If there's no other questions, or well, to the committee, are there any comments or questions? Or if not, I'll, I'll entertain a, a motion to approve the modified uh, schedule good start times. So, um, so moved, sorry. Seconder. Okay. Um, so we'll call vote, Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. Uh, Rich. Aye. Diana. Aye. I'm an aye as well. So it passes. Thank you very much. I think that's all on the reopening. I think we are moving on to very exciting budget goals. So, Mr. Um, yeah, thank you, Chairman Buckley. Um, so, yeah, moving on to some more more typical business that we would typically cover at this at this time of year. Um, it has been customary that we, you know, shortly after our goals workshop, that we we certainly start talking about fiscal twenty two uh, budget goals and budget calendar around this time. So, what I attempted to do, what I included in your packet. I was going to address the budget goals first um, as I, you know, checked my notes in terms of the, the goal session that we had at the last, um, you know, earlier in, in July. And, and I think the attempt was to really kind of focus the, not only the, on a broader perspective, the, the school committee goals for this upcoming uh, school year, but also the, the budget goals as well. Um, so I included a, a, um, um, you know, my attempt to, to to capture the the focus of that that conversation and during the goals workshop, and have proposed the the following seven seven goals. Uh, the first to approve a fiscal year twenty two budget that adequately meets the district requirements for optimum student achievement. Second to successfully negotiate a collective bargaining agreement with the NRA that is due to expire. In, at the end of the current fiscal year, 2021. The third was to support the process to negotiate a new contract with a qualified transportation provider while adhering to state procurement law. So we, I, I know we had discussion around the fact that this wasn't um, something that we were gonna have to do this year. It's kind of part of our regular business and part of something that we would be doing anyway, but I, that's why I, 
and focused on it more of sort of supporting that process to try to, to make that a, a, as competitive as we can. Um, we, I believe we decided to keep budget goal four to continue to explore the options of reductions of fees and the tuitions that um, are assessed, mainly athletics, kindergarten, transportation, fine arts, um, and all other educational programs as a long-term budget goal. So that's been there for a, a number of years. Um, but I think, I believe the conversation was, so let, let's, let's keep that on there as that continues to be a focus. Um, the fifth budget goal there is just to continue to explore opportunities to re reduce expenses associated with energy. Um, we know we already addressed LED lighting. So I, I guess this is, we could probably take, take that off, but we're going to be certainly monitoring that process this year. So that's why I kind of left it there in the parentheses. We're going to revisit solar power. Um, unfortunately, we had a setback with the, the bid and the potential contract that we were working on um, following town meeting this year. So we're going to revisit that and work with RMLD to try to see if there's an advantageous um, solar agreement that we can work with both for the school and the town potentially. And then any other um, energy upgrades that may be out there and available. We know there's, there's boiler and, and steam trap and, and, and things with windows that the MSBA um, offers incentives for. So just to continue to look at ways to con control our operating costs. Um, I know we talked about this one as a need to monitor the impact of the COVID-19 virus on the budget development process um, and maximize all areas of available funding through both federal, state, and local sources. So I thought that was an important one. I think that I tried to capture the, um, you know, the, the, the big, um, you know, essence of what we were talking about that, that during the goals workshop. So I, I hope that, that captures it. And then the, the final one there was just to continue to collaborate with the members of the finance planning team, the chairs and vice chairs, and the town finance director and town administrator. So a little bit of a smaller list. I think they were, we're trying to focus our efforts. Um, and I guess I'll turn it over to any questions. Any questions from the committee or public? My only question is, are we going to separately vote to to adopt these, Michael? Is that what we typically do? And then we separately vote on the other schedule? Yes, Mr. Buckley. I think I think that is what we've done in the past. We've sort of, it's been two different motions to accept as presented. So, Mr. Buckley, I can make a motion if you'd like. Absolutely. I have no comments. Uh, we vote. Yeah, obviously people can chime in, uh, but uh, I move that we vote to accept the uh, fiscal year 2022 budget goals as uh, presented. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. Chris? Aye. Janine? Aye. I'm an I as well. Thank you, Michael, for putting that together. No problem. Thank you. Um, the second part of the presentation was around the, the budget timeline for fiscal year 22. So follow the similar similar timeline and process that we've had in the past. I think it goes without saying that we'll probably maybe need some more updates on um, what's happening with some of the, the other available sources of funding through um, both the federal and state state resources um, and, and impact of, of COVID-19. And I think we'll be doing that um, both from fiscal 2021 uh, perspective as well as a, a fiscal 22. Um, so I think that will certainly be be part of the, these conversations um, you know, throughout the fiscal year when we do our monthly budget updates um, as, as well as when we get into the fiscal 22 budget. Um, but I think, you know, certainly this, I think this timeline for the most part has worked with both our needs um, as well as the town's uh, budget calendar. So here we are this evening talking about the calendar and the budget goals. Um, September 21, I would look to present updates to our large capital improvement plan, both three-year and five-year capital improvement plan. 
we would look to have the committee vote on that plan on, on October 5th. I believe that will meet the, the CIPC's timeline, which is usually the um, three-year project, large capital project requests are due the first week in October. Um, we start our internal process with budget leaders um, around mid-October, so that, that process would, would kick off. Um, we would do five and 10 year enrollment projections shortly after our October one enrollment counts are finalized and certified. So that would happen on November 2nd. And that to me really kicks, kicks starts the, the budget conversation in terms of staffing needs uh, and changes for the upcoming school year. Um, budget requests typically are, are due back to the finance office around uh, Thanksgiving or, or just before the Thanksgiving holiday. So we would stick to that timeline. We would release our preliminary budget book to the school committee right around the, the week of February break and allow for the school committee to have um, that document um, for about a couple of weeks before the preliminary presentation, which would happen the first week in March on March 1st. We would continue to do budget videos and webinars to the community throughout this process, but we would do our official budget webinar the last week in March, which is what we've been doing on March 26th. And then once the budget's out there and released, and we've gotten maybe some initial feedback on that, we would start to hold our budget workshops. Um, workshop number one would occur on March 31st. We would then hold our annual public hearing on April 12th. I'm, there would probably definitely be a need for a second workshop on April 28th to um, ref reflect on feedback and we've had from the public hearing. And then on April, on May 3rd, the first week in May, we would hopefully officially vote our budget. And that would be in time to make the town meeting warrant um, at the end of that week. And then we would present that budget to the finance committee and town meeting, which I believe would happen I believe it's going to be June 7th, but it would be that first week in, or that, that first or second Monday in June would be town meeting. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Excellent. Anybody? Uh, my, my only thought at all was just the CIPC stuff. I wonder if that's going to get delayed at all. Um, Diana, do you, do you have any idea? Or, or Michael, you're on the committee as well. Has there been any yeah. discussion about that? It's a good, it's a great question. I had that thought as well. We, we haven't had um, that conversation yet. I I'm anticipating the chair of that committee, Don Kelleher, will probably call a meeting together um, early fall, maybe after the start of the school year. Because um, I think there's also a need to potentially, uh, as we approach the fall town meetings, maybe even a little bit earlier than that, um, to potentially do a see if there's a need to make requests for those projects that were deferred um, in June, given the situation that we are in. So that there's probably gonna need to be a meeting that occurs in the coming weeks to talk about that as we approach the October town meeting. And then at that point, they'll decide whether they're gonna adjust any of those dates. Um, so this obviously assumes that we'll follow the same timeline, but I, I think there's, there's a p p possibility that those that timeline might get pushed back a little bit. Yeah, that's actually an excellent point, Michael, that you made where, um, if people don't know, we took a pretty conservative approach last year with a projecting a 10% reduction in uh, revenues for state aid. And it, it, right now they're saying it's going to be fully funded. So that means there is some additional money. And so we should really look to see if there's anything that was on the capital improvement plan that we really need to push to, to reconsider because we have more money. Right. So yeah, I anticipate that we'll have a meeting to discuss that. Um, you know, the decision back in in May and June, prior to the the June town meeting, early June, was to only move forward with the most essential projects, um, town road and a couple other uh, town and school, um, you know, facility uh, vehicle related items. So I, I think there would there would be a need to to talk about it as well. Great. Any other thoughts? I don't hear any. I'll entertain a motion to accept. I'll make a motion that the committee vote to accept the uh, budget timeline as presented. I will second with the words of it being fluid. 
just uh, okay. for obvious reasons. Yeah, it's it's good to it's good to have a uh, some markers down, but we know we all know what the situation is likely to be. Fluid, so. Right. Okay. Any discussion? The roll call vote again. Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. Diana. Aye. I'm an I as well. Pass this five zero. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Great. Thank you, everyone. Now we move on to the superintendent's and superintendent's evaluation. I think I'm turning this over to Mr. Papa Vasilio. Uh, yes. Yes, you are. And Dr. Daly is loading that up. Thank you very much. One second, just have the document in the right window. There we go. So um, my first time kind of walking through this. Uh, I'll just kind of give a quick overview, and then I'll speak for the, the general findings of the committee. And um, we'll, we'll do this as four standards. So after each standard, I'll, I'll read the comments that uh, I compiled from people. And if anyone on the committee has anything that they'd like to add, then we'll, we'll take a moment after each standard. Um, and, um, and that's how we'll run this. So Dr. Daly is evaluated along four standards. Uh, instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, professional culture. To take all of the suspense out of it, we thought he did an excellent job um, this year, uh, particularly given the, uh, the situation that unfolded before him, and we ranked him as proficient in three of the standards and exemplary in one. And I will walk us through those uh, right now and then kind of circle back to the overall um, evaluation. So for standard one, uh, which is, oh, excuse me, my computer's slowing down. Uh, standard one for instructional leadership. Uh, some of the thoughts of the committee were that Dr. Daly's entry into the role was hijacked by COVID-19, which particularly impacted instructional leadership. But despite these challenges, Dr. Daly helped to create materials where students could learn and guided the district through the spring semester as well as could be expected. Uh, also the school closure and subsequent three month uh, three months of online engagement have caused a break in many of the sources of data used to measure students. Bridging that gap in data will require a focused effort from Dr. Daly and his instructional leadership team. Um, we thought that he he did a fine job in navigating an impossible situation and uh, and really got us into a, a, a pretty good place for us to start school in the fall. Uh, along the lines of instructional leadership, would anybody like to add any thoughts, comment, question, anything like that? I mean, I, I'll say that, well, I, I use the word hijack, so I know what comment was mine, but um, yeah, I mean, I think instructional leadership was really hard because I think that's one area that's probably Dr. Daly's strength in many ways. Um, and because of COVID, a lot of that wasn't able to be seen in the same way. I think we're seeing it right now as Dr. Daly is helping to craft a plan for this coming year. And so I think that's really where he's been shining. Um, but I, I have no concern. That was not a concern at all going for, um, when we hired Dr. Daly. I thought it would be one of his strengths. I thought that, you know, the first part of the year was, you know, the first part of his tenure was a little bit odd because, you know, learning didn't look the same way as it has before. But I thought he's been exceptional when trying to plan for this coming year. I would agree. Making a generalization about all superintendents throughout really the country, this is the area that this is the plan that kind of had to get thrown out the window when uh, when COVID nineteen hit, um, and Rocky as it as it was for everybody, um, I think he did a, a good job navigating it. And and I think that what you're talking about, Mr. Buckley, the strengths that Dr. Daly brings in terms of planning, are really going to be paying dividends um, moving forward in the fall. Now that we have time to, to kind of adjust our practices to what we're dealing with. Um, moving along to standard two, which is management and operations. This was an area where uh, some of the original plans of Dr. Daly in terms of trying to increase the savviness of, uh, of the district's use of internet and, uh, and access to online resources, I think, paid off from, his, from, from their inception. Uh, to quote members of the Committee, coronavirus is a health and safety issue, and Dr. Daly has helped to create excellent systems to address the myriad issues in a short period of time. He 
He's worked well with his administrative team to manage the budget in the spring and craft a budget for the coming year. Dr. Daly has adjusted well to the constantly shifting demands of state education officials, creating and adjusting plans for online engagement in the spring and especially in preparation of the upcoming year. The fiscal 2021 budget will be an ongoing challenge. Um, we, you know, really for each of these, we could point out uh, uh, particular areas of, of strength, but uh, this was something that I think Dr. Daly excelled in and did a fine job in as well, uh, despite the challenges uh, that rose up. Would anybody like to add anything for standard number two, management and operations? I'm never shy to jump in, so I'll just say that I focus more on budget here, and this was the first year that Dr. Daly had to do a budget, and it was the year where we were projecting a 10% loss of state revenue, which had a lot of really hard decisions, and so I think this is also a big piece where Michael Connolly is is really important for um, some of the operations here. And you know, when we were doing the budget last year, we talked about how a lot of the way that we balance this was by uh, Dr. Daly and other leaders in, in our community taking or in our schools taking you know on additional responsibilities. Um, he was without an assistant superintendent for he is still without an assistant superintendent, and so I think that's something to be noted. Um, you know, it's been very challenging, but you know, I, I thought he did very well through those uh, those items. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. I mean, I just just as for all of us to, to keep in mind as we start that budget process for 2022, um, it'll be important to to sort of reestablish. You know, if, if we are looking at reduced revenues uh, ongoing. Uh, that we really establish what the right balance in, in the administrative team versus instructional team is um, because we can't uh, you know i think this we put put so much on dr daly and the whole admission you know senior administrative team that i'm not sure that's sustainable so we so we'll have to work hard to strike that right balance great thank you mr mcgowan um for standard three uh family and community engagement. So we set a, a, a very high bar for expectations in this town for our school system and our superintendent. And I thought Dr. Daly met all of our all of our uh, expectations, but here he really uh, exceeded them, I think. Uh, he did an exceptional job working through this pandemic. His consistent communication with parents, administration, faculty, and all the boards, state and local, uh, has been immeasurable. Um, you'll hear that comment echoed here by a couple different members of the of the committee. Um, but that uh, really, the uncertainty of everything around us has been one of the more difficult pills to swallow uh, about COVID nineteen, and the only way to combat that is with communication. At times, it's difficult because uh, by nature we're we're relying on information from the state and sometimes the country, uh, which doesn't come at the speed we'd want it to. But I think Dr. Daly has done uh, a really exemplary job of, of doing what he had to share. Um, uh, anybody in the committee want to add or, uh, or I guess add? No, not even Mr. Buckland. All right. Well, I get paid by word. I was trying to let other people jump in, but um... I, I would say, you know, I, I mentioned that I thought instructional leadership was going to be Dr. Daly's strength. And I'll be honest, one of my concerns was going to be the family and community engagement, not because of anything with him, but really had had a lot to do with his predecessors, who I thought were exceptionally um, strong in this area. Um, and I've been very, very pleased with uh, Dr. Daly's communication style, the amount of it. I thought that overall, there's you know, a community obviously wants to understand what's going on and and they want answers right away. And I think he found the right balance between getting information out there, but not giving information that he'd have to later retract and change. And so I think he's been, you know, very good at, with that. Um, as chair, since he's been here, I've been, you know, I, I've been in communication with him a lot and it's been, you know, a pleasure to get to know him a bit and see how his brain works. And so it's been... You know, it's been an honor to work with him this year through this pandemic. I agree. Um, I'll 
continue on then to the final standard, standard four, professional culture. Um, here to quote the committee, when social and racial justice became a polarizing subject, Dr. Daly called together a wonderful working group to allow the community to discuss the issue. He has further work to make immediate changes by aligning educator goals and professional development opportunities to the subject. In addition to the social and racial justice work, Dr. Daly's embrace of the 10 professional development trainings, uh, training days shows his commitment to uniting staff around the development of new ways of thinking about learning, both in response to the pandemic and for the future in general. Um, really, I think that the uh, a, a clear example of this came through tonight as Dr. Daly was discussing uh, the idea that there'd be a number of changes that our school needed to go through to meet the challenges of coronavirus, but that we could use this as an opportunity to make, uh, to prioritize the changes that are good for the school regardless of coronavirus and really improve upon things. And and that speaks to the tone of culture that he sets throughout the schools, trying to find ways to improve and always keeping an eye ahead. And I think you see that in these actions. Um, one more time, any members of the committee, particularly Mr. Buckley, want to add anything to this? Point, point and counterpoint. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I, I think he's done a great job with this. Um, you know, I think there's been, I, I didn't want this whole evaluation to be dominated by COVID like everything else is. Um, but I think there's been other, other issues that have come up and, you know, I think he's been great about bringing the right people together and over communicating and, you know, the professional culture, it's really worked. And again, I mean, I think this, the administration that we've had in North Reading for a number of years has, you know, prioritized having good relationships with, you know, throughout the, throughout the district. And, you know, I think Dr. Daly has maintained that and, you know, really worked to bring people together. Um, and so it's been, it, he's done a great job with it. Yeah. And, and I just, just reiterate that same thing. And we see that uh, both in the discussions we're in the middle of with the NREA and, and, and the other uh, and the sort of somewhat pre-COVID uh, negotiations that we went through with some of the other bargaining units that, uh, you know, that relationship is, th those relationships are strong and that's part of all this. So I agree. Yep. And I'll, I'll ultimately say that Dr. Daly has done an excellent job over the past year and we will need him to continue to do an excellent job for our district to, uh, to continue up to its standards over the course of the challenges ahead. Uh, and those are the findings. So Dr. Daly, do you have any questions? I have no questions at this time. I, I really appreciate the very thorough feedback and, and thoughtfulness that you put into this. This was my first time obviously submitting a, a portfolio and being evaluated publicly, um, but it, it was, um, I think you gave me some great feedback, some very encouraging and, and some humbling uh, thoughts. It's been quite a, a first few months on the job and uh, not the way I expected. I make the joke all the time. Yeah, it's exactly how I pictured it, you know, so it's, it's been different, but um, you know, I've really tried to be thoughtful about communication and about some of these other forms. I think I, I try to, to do things that I, I believe in, which is, you know, bringing all stakeholders together and, and not always doing what's easy, doing what's hard, because that's the right thing to do. And, and that's what I try to do. But I, I have to say that so much of what's reflected in, in my goals and, and in any successes I've had are the people around me and, and the support of this committee, um, the openness and the willingness to, to commit and, and all my administrative teams, starting with Michael Connolly, especially as a, as a solid backbone of this district and the incredible team that I have. Um, all of these goals are because of the team effort. And so really you can see each and every one of our administrators, teachers, and leaders in, in, in those goals reflected. So any success that I have is, is because of the team we have here. So thank you so much for, um, for your feedback. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, will just, I will just add, Chris, that I, I want to find more negative things to say, honestly. I think you, you, you should have goals to improve on. And I just think it's um, been such a strange year and you've done a great job with it, Dr. Daly. And so, um, you know, if, if next year we find some some more things, don't take it personally. Like, I think it's good to have areas to improve on, but I, I genuinely think you've done a great job. I, I certainly know my areas of improvement. That's not a, <laughs> we're going to start tomorrow at our administrative retreat, which we're still having, by the way. Um, it's going to look a little different this year, but 
we're having our retreat. We're going to talk about our, our five-year plan and, 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 and really some areas where we can start, you know, continuing to do things better. And as, as much as we don't want to, you know, take our eyes off of reopening and COVID, I think we need to step back a little bit and make sure that everything we're doing now is still aligned with our vision and our future for this district. So that's what tomorrow is going to be like. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, great. That's that concludes the evaluation of Dr. Daly. We're keeping them. You? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we're under contract, so it's not really. That's true. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't. I don't know if the evaluation of ourselves is good, but I'll. Uh, it shouldn't probably shouldn't be honestly. But uh, Mr. McGowan, I'll turn it over to you for our self evaluation. Yes. Thank you. Um, and. Um, so let me just say what we did, what I did with this document, and you know we're still. I think we're still looking for. The good news is our evaluation, although it's it's obviously very important that we go through this process. We're not under the same reporting requirements that, that Dr. Daly is. So I'm still waiting for a couple of inputs on this, and I will complete the document, and then perhaps we can include it in the minutes of this meeting. But uh, just the overall themes, I think, are are here. Um, uh, so the way I handled this is similar to what I did last year, which is to come up with an average for each of the uh, categories here based on the numerical uh, values of the of the of each member's uh, sort of selection of whether it's needs improvement, proficient, or exemplary. Um, and so those values are are listed there. And also I came up with just for just to see what it looked like, I came up with an average score for each category. Um, so you see there, for instance, under leadership and governance, that the average of all the uh, individual items comes out to 3.1, which was within the proficient uh, range. Um, some of the comments, uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting that you, we do see some different views um, here. Uh, I, you know, I think I think as a committee, we we are obviously a very dedicated committee. Um, um, we all uh, have a great deal of uh, interest here and are acting and, and we all act it's really a great committee to be a part of because we all come in and act in good faith and, and are very supportive of each other and and uh, but I do think there are some areas and 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 these sort of preliminary numbers show that um, you know there's some areas where we have not really been able to at least and I can say especially for me personally I, there's some areas where I, I, I hope to improve and you know I think professional development is one of those areas um, uh, where, where, you know, I, I really hope to be able to take some time and, and, uh, and, and, and do some more activities, uh, so I can learn more about some of the processes that we go through. Um, I'm working off of this screen. So, um, I, I you know, I, I, I think, um, one of the, one of the areas that I, I really think we need to look at, and I think it shows in some of the comments is, is. You know, just this evaluation itself and, and our goals process, um, you know, I think if we can work to align our goals uh, a little more directly with some of the district goals, I think would also be um, an interesting exercise. Uh, the educational program, you know, the, the committee, again, I'd like to understand more about this process, or about how we can uh, sort of collaborate in this process with the district. Um, but I think, you know, Overall, we uh, fall into sort of that proficient category. Um, so, uh, and then uh, the financial. I think we're. I think we're. Most people are in agreement that the, the category of financial and asset management is is uh, our strength, and also uh, as we indicated before, a strength of the district. Um, you know, we obviously gain a lot of our strength from. Uh, Mr. Connolly and uh, and Dr. Daly and, and their work on this area, but um, it's something I think we've we've all supported. I think one of the comments talks about how this has been a strength for for uh, quite a while now in the committee, um, certainly before my time, and uh, I think that continues. And then, ironically, uh, if we go down to the last category, the um, family and community relations, I think you know, although this was a great strength of Dr. Daly's, I'm not sure. Uh, so far, it's been a strength of the committee. We've talked a lot about um, in the past about, uh, for instance, coming up with a, 
sort of a, a, a way, ways to engage with the community more directly. None of us are too thrilled about the idea of, of social media, but um, you know, I think that, uh, so we, we know what we don't want to do. I haven't, don't know that we figured out yet what we do want to do and how we can engage the, the community a little more directly. And I know, especially for me, um, who has less sort of direct contact, uh, not having kids in school, uh, uh, you know, I have a lot less direct contact with, with uh, members of the community who do have kids in school. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I do think it'll be of value if we can, um, um, and I think some of these comments suggest this as well, if we can figure out ways to engage the community more directly with the school committee itself, not just with, with the district. So that's a very obviously quick and high level overview. Um, if anybody wants to uh, have any, add any comments, uh, now's a good time. I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, I was not, um, I, I did not do the evaluation. Um, so I hope that by my not contributing um, had uh, something to do with the low numbers because um, there's a lot of them. I'm just saying because uh, normally I think as a board in the past, there might have been maybe a handful of ones that were below two five. And that was kind of like the ones that we would focus on. So my apologies um, for not contributing at this time. So I will get it to you and hopefully we can reevaluate and um, go from there. I, I, I'll jump in and just say that you know, I, I think overall, when I when I look at the committee we have, I think we have a really nice mix of people. You know, we have two people who have kids out of school. We have one that doesn't have kids in school yet, and we have two that have kids in school. Um, we have a mix of, you know, educate, uh, people that are educators, people that have never done education. Um, but we have an inexperienced committee, and I think that's what this is. I mean, we all have to learn. Um, you know, three of our five members are in their first term. Um, I am just started my second term. So that means four out, of, four out of the five of us haven't completed four years on, a, on the school committee. And, you know, there's a learning curve for this. And so I think, you know, we had a very experienced school committee for a number of years. Um, we were very fortunate there, but, you know, we've had other people that have stepped up and, you know, are trying their best to do it. Um, and a lot has changed. I mean, you know, personally, there's been, you know, with COVID, a lot of people have been working from home and, and struggling with this. And, you know, the commitment has been a lot more than a lot of people envision. I mean, last, usually summer's nothing. And I mean, I can say personally, I've put a lot of hours in this summer. And so, you know, but I think, I think we all talked last year about not wanting a bunch of fours on our self evaluation. We really wanted to say where we're, where we're good, where we're really good, and where we need to improve. And so, personally, I like seeing, you know, twos and threes with a couple of, you know, higher threes and, you know, a couple of lower twos where we agree on where we need to um, improve. The real question is, what do we do to make those improvements? And, you know, I think this year at our summer meeting, we talked a lot about this, about trying to very, really clarify what our goals are for this year and cut a lot of stuff out that weren't our, you know, weren't really goals. And so I think we're making the improvements that we need. Um, but that's just my thoughts. I mean, I think you know, we should be around, you know, high twos, low threes and most things. I agree that uh, we shouldn't. We should. We should see this. I mean, nobody. You know, the community. You know, obviously, this document is public. People may look at it, and 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 it may help form their opinions. But I think this is mostly for us. So I, I think um, I think that um, we should. I mean, if 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 members feel that you know that we deserve high scores in every area, then they, obviously they should put that down. But I don't think you should be. We, I don't think we should uh, back off of putting you know scores that we think are right regardless of, of, of what they are so I mean I think it's it's just good discussions to have and, and uh, so we don't have Mel's fives you know uh, in in here to kind of yeah. bring us up <laughs> I, I didn't mean to allude to that we should be <laughs> rated higher I just yes. felt that because I know I didn't participate on the right. evaluation that it might have changed a little. Not that I may disagree with 
the lower scores, just that my input wasn't there. That's what I meant. And and so we look forward to uh, you know we'll, we'll 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 take that feedback and 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 we'll get every member's um, uh, feedback in this document before we uh, declare it final. You are the kind one of the committee, Janine. Thank you both. <laughs> okay, Dr. Daly, you want to evaluate us? No, I think you're doing a great job, and I agree that we've had uh, lots of great open conversations, and I I think that's been very productive. One thought that popped into my mind about the communication is that, you know, these virtual forums have afforded us uh, a larger number of public participants, I'd say, than we typically have in person. And maybe as we look to transitioning back, we think about ways to continue to use technology to incorporate public feedback and, and questions, um, obviously following the laws as they change and adjust, but there may be some ways to, to do a bit of a quote unquote hybrid, um, even with our meetings as we move forward and move back to in person to still incorporate, because um, I, I do think, you know, allowing the technology allows for some people who might otherwise not be able to attend a meeting to be able to hear or to, um, to have a question asked and answered. So something you could possibly look at as two-way communication in the future. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And it, it was when we were talking about future business, I was going to ask this, but it's a perfect segue. Um, I mean, I think once the school reopens, I think we should also probably consider going back in person. Now, I know there's also challenges. We don't want people that are not don't need to be in the in the school buildings to be in the school buildings. And that's where our meeting typically is. Um, but I don't know what other people's thoughts are on this, but I think that's maybe this is a point to talk about it. I personally think once the school opens, we should try to have the committee members um, in person, you know, six feet apart with face masks. But um, I don't know what other people think. And, and if other people feel comfortable doing that, I personally do feel comfortable. Um, and I have no reservations about that. But I'm wondering what the other committee members think about that. Um, maybe I'll start with Mr. McGowan. So I am generally comfortable with that. I think we would probably want to um, minimize our time in the building. So maybe not coming through, you know, just being having more direct routes or or just, you know, we figure out some different ways. But because uh, we certainly don't want to put any extra stress on the buildings um, and whatever requirements are there for cleaning and, and whatnot. So but, you know, if 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 uh, a majority of the committee is comfortable, I, or, or well, I, I, maybe it's not even a majority thing. Maybe we need to talk about what how we make that final decision. But um, I, I would certainly be comfortable talking about that. Mrs. Embriano, I am totally comfortable with going back to open meetings um, in person. Yeah, and I and I think we would still have the public. Via, via video just because we don't want the, everybody in the building, but you know, that makes, the building. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Diana, thoughts? I'm completely fine with going back. And you want to go every day, right? Every single day. And Chris? Uh, oh, I get to, I get to break unanimity. Um, I don't have an issue per se with going back in and of itself. I think that sure, if we're six feet apart, it, it, it would be safe enough for, for my own personal standards. But my question would be if, if the idea is that we want to limit it because we want to stress the building as little as possible, then why would we go back? This, this avenue worked perfectly well for us. It, uh, it wouldn't allow the community to be any more involved if we went back, particularly given that they wouldn't be coming with us. So I guess I don't really see the purpose of changing. I mean, I think I think the obvious purpose would be, if, even if it's not an actual, uh, if it doesn't add anything to the to the discussion, I think just pointing out that you know we're asking our teachers and our educators and our administrators and our students to go back, <clears throat> just so that we can, you know, show that we believe it's safe and we think it's a good strong point, you know, that we feel safe being there as well. Um, you know, and being in masks and sitting six feet apart. And so to me, I think that's what it is. I don't think it adds the, you know, I don't think it's going to create better discussion. I think 
you know, if we're asking teachers to go back, um, you know, we should feel comfortable going back as well. And yeah, that's my thoughts. I mean, this is Corona and added in it's safe for students and teachers. It should be safe for everyone and how many people attend the school committee meeting. And again, this is the balance where, you know, we don't, we're not going to have parents in the buildings pretty much this year. You know, we're not going to be leasing our space to sports leagues. And so we're not, we're going to be con more concerned about who's in the building, but I think for school committee members, we should be. And, you know, and frankly, it's been nice having a lot of people at the meetings and I want to make sure that, it, you know, while there's, I, I have a feeling with with updates, we're going to have updates well into the year that the community is going to be interested in hearing about. So having you know an ability for them to hybrid in will be would be useful, and not just watch it on cable, but also and then maybe text me during the meeting, but also be able to add their actual uh, thoughts during the meeting. So, you know, I, I I agree with the sentiment that oh I'm sorry, uh, yeah. I, oh, go ahead, Chris. I agree with the sentiment that if, if we're going to say it's safe for students and faculty to go back, then it's certainly safe for us to go back. I think it would be completely safe for us as individuals to go back. I would just think as a teacher, uh, I would want the limit to be to the bare essential. I would want, as, or as a person that had to go into that situation daily, I'd like to know that as few people go in as are necessary. And I just view us as not necessary to that as we, we have this, this forum. I, I wouldn't be worried for, for my health. I think that it would be completely safe for us to go back. We're, we're, we're taking pains to make it so. I mean, I think that's a good counterpoint to the showing leadership by going. Um, maybe it's, maybe, I guess you could make the argument we'd be showing leadership by not going. Um, certainly we want to get feedback from you, Dr. Daly and Mr. Connolly about, uh, about all of these issues. Um, um, I don't know what your thoughts are at the moment, but. I can share that um, I can definitely see points on both sides. Um, I guess I question if, if we're hybrid, does everybody need to come back? Or I mean, because the meeting is still virtual. It's just similar to what we're saying with the, the teachers and students that you could be anywhere and still engaged in the, in the meeting, right? So just if we're doing a virtual meeting, where you are could be different. Is that correct, Mr. Buckley? Like, would all five members need to be at the school or could someone be remote? at this time and still be a participant. Yeah, I, I certainly think people could be remote. I mean, the governor's order still allows still allows us to do it remote, but, you know, it, it would be more, again, I, I don't think we're going to be more effective or less effective if we're in person. Um, I just think it's more about, you know, showing. And, and, and again, and I, and I see both sides of it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really open to either way if people say, you know, look, we want to limit the number of people in the schools. And so, you know, I, I completely understand that point, but I think to me personally, I think the overriding issue would be, you know, I wouldn't want to, you know, ask anybody to go into a school and, and then not be willing to do it myself. And so for me, that's where I personally stand and I think it would be. And so I think what we'll probably end up doing is scheduling the meeting and I will plan on being in person and whoever feels comfortable doing that can join and people who don't feel comfortable don't want you don't have to join and they can just do it you know virtually but i think that's probably where we'll where we'll be um you know again well, are we I mean, ready think, to yeah. do are we ready to do that from a technological standpoint or you know have in place so, a system in the in the room that allows virtual participation yeah so what that's something that i've been thinking about mr mcgowan i i would suggest that we do a telephone um just to see, you know, when Michael and I sometimes are in the same room and we're conferencing, we found that using the, the speakerphone is much more effective. So we, we're kind of looking at our screens, but the audio is through the phone. I think that's what I would recommend for that situation as well. So we would, we would equip that room with that. Um, you know, the question I would have then about NORCAM, um, you know, are they going to come in and, and, you know, show a video of us all looking at our computers? Or do we just keep doing what we've been doing for the virtual sessions? Again, that's other people coming in the building. So my thought was that we maybe just continue doing the virtual recordings. Um, that way we're seeing your faces as opposed to a, a, a sort of a, a, a bird's eye view of us looking at screens. And it also, these recordings show the documents that are being shared as well, which I think is helpful for the public um, to see. So. My recommendation is to is to keep 
doing the, the virtual with the live streams and using the speakerphone if we were to be in public. I don't know what others think on that. Certainly sounds workable. I'm not obviously versed enough with the Zoom to uh, make an opinion, but what you're saying sounds like the right way to go. Will we get a Chromebook issued to us is my only question. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we can work on that, but, you know, hopefully by the 17th, we're going to have this somewhat figured out anyways. And so I would say for the meetings, you know, maybe after the 17th or maybe after the 1st, depending on when we decide um, we should, I, I, th I think we should at least try it. And, you know, the reality is, you know, I, I've been in the building already, um, not all the building, just certain parts of it, because I have to sign certain things. So, Chris, I've already been in, in Dr. Daly's office. And so we've, uh, you know, there, there's there's going to be some amount of activity that has to happen. Um, and I, think it, I think it's good to show that we think it's safe. That's just my opinion. So, okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep everybody updated, um, you know, later on, but... We have our routine matters for the few people that have stayed with us. Um, we're going to go to minutes, and I don't, I don't know what we were going to do if Mrs. Imbriano wasn't able to make it today. Um, there's a chance she might not be able to make it. That would have involved, you know, us all having to read the minutes. So I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Imbriano for some motions on the minutes. All right. I need to see the actual dates because I forget <coughs> them. Um, hold on. Let me pull them up on my phone. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Daly. Yeah, we'll bring them up for us. All right. <clears throat> I make a motion to accept the minutes for the open session of July 20th as written. I'll second. Any discussion on this one? Any errors found? I saw none. Good enough for me. So we'll do a roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chris? Aye. Diana? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes by zero unanimous. Thank you. For the minutes of the executive, executive session for July 20th, um, I make a motion to accept as written. I'll second. Any discussion here? Uh, roll call vote again. Janine? Aye. Uh, Rich? Aye. Chris? Aye. Diana? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes 5 0 unanimous. I make a motion to accept the minutes for open session of July 30th, 8 a.m., um, as written. I'll second. Any discussion here? Okay, roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chris? Aye. Diana? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Passes by zero. I'll make a motion to accept the open session minutes of August 7th at a.m. as written. I'll second. Any discussion here? Roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chris? Aye. Diana? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes 5 0 unanimous. I believe that's all. I do believe that is all. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Imbriano. Okay. Budget update. Um, Mr. Connolly? Yes. Uh, so this evening, um, there was the fourth quarter student activity report. Uh, which reflects activity through the end of fiscal year 20, which um, obviously is June 30th, as of June 30th. So we have reconciled all and certified our bank account balances and reconciled those balances to the uh, accounting system. And as we have been doing over these last couple of years, and we, the five school student activity accounts balances are reflected in the memorandum and the report that was provided um, and then for the middle school and the high school um, for the 
two schools that obviously have various sub accounts. Um, that detail was was also provided and is reflected in the report. Um, so we are continuing to just make sure we adhere to as the student activity guidelines. Um, one thing as of note for the the high school, there was there was some late revenue that came in that was identified as being part of the class of 2019. So we are in the process of trying to reach out to the, the former offices of 2019 to make them aware, to see if we can either get them those funds. Um, and if not, maybe if they elect to maybe donate those to the active class accounts, we would then, uh, we would then make that adjustment to the report. And then we will be in contact with the class of 2020 to determine what they would like to do with their year end balance as well. Typically, that amount, a, a large portion of the amount is donated. Um, and what the classes have been doing is they have been electing to donate towards the, the purchase of a, a school uh, sign to be displayed, electronic sign to be displayed um, at the front entrance of the, the high school, the middle school. Um, I think it's fair that I did have conversations with the with Principal LaPrette and I I think we're getting closer to being able to make that happen should should the class of 2020 fall fall suit so um that's where the the status of of uh the class accounts stand as of yet if there's if there's any particular questions on that um that being said i'll just open it up to any any other questions on the report anybody have any questions for michael the only question that i had was obvious um for the amount and it kind of made sense obviously they couldn't spend what the, yeah. the cash that they had so it makes sense that it's that high obviously not only for the graduating um seniors but also for maskers and notorious because they normally um uh, expend that money due to their travels and such that's correct so yeah these balances are certainly higher than maybe they, they would have been should um the, should they have been able to do all the activities that were planned, trips, um, senior activities at the at the end of the year? Um, so that's that's correct. I mean, my concerns are more about you know stipends for this coming year and you know having a plan, just like we were talking about sports. If it gets charged and it doesn't happen, um, or making sure that it might happen, you know, in in if it's virtual, but. I don't think we have to go into it right now. I just think that's something we have to be careful about. Like last year, we kind of got caught having to deal with a situation later on. Now we're, you know, now we know that it's a possibility. So I just want to make sure that we are very careful about that. Like if we're going to charge fees to someone, making sure we have a plan for when they will be, you know, incurred, when they will be refunded, things, things along those lines. Um, I just want to make sure we're really careful before we take money in from parents um or, or students that we you know are really thinking about what's being delivered and you know and and when we're going to keep them and when we're going to refund them absolutely yeah it's good definitely a good point so certainly things will be monitoring closely and taking taking a close look at it before any final registration or is published or uh, communication is sent out um, any other thoughts, comments, questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Thank you. Staffing, Dr. Daly. This year, there's some documents here for some updates in the staffing, um, <clears throat> just to share with everyone here. Um, I did share this out in mid July, but there have been a few hires, uh, since that time. Um, I believe, uh, I don't believe James Burke, computer science digital learning specialist, was on there last time. James um, James is a paraprofessional in our district who's now going to be a computer science digital learning. Very excited about that. Uh, Caitlin Tropiano, also uh, a member of the high school staff, is a paraprofessional, now rising to the position of student academic liaison at the high school. And we've hired a few others district wide. Keith Lum is a maintenance custodian. Uh, Katie Lombardi is our floater nurse, so we're now going to have a sixth nurse among our five schools as a part of the way we spent our funds from uh, one of the, the COVID uh, grants that we received. 
Uh, Mr. Kevin Pierce is coming on as a secondary team chairperson in the long-term sub role, replacing uh, Andrea Barlow. Mr. Pierce uh, not only is uh, an experienced uh, ch team chairperson, but he has some administrative roles, which will, uh, in the past, and some experience, which will provide us some additional stability um, in the district. As 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 many are aware, we're, we have a, a administrator out on a leave at this time. And so having another experienced uh, person in that role is going to be a great asset to the district. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, in, in June, Nan Cook, our data specialist, has retired. And we have Stacy Albano, who has started as of last week as our new data specialist. Um, it's quite a time for someone to come into that role, as you can imagine, with so much uh, going on and so much changing. And Stacy's done a great job uh, adjusting here in, in, her, in her first week. Um, I think I may have couple of others here. So Colleen Hegarty is a grade two classroom teacher, long-term sub. Gretchen Daly, general paraprofessional in kindergarten. Rachel Vitale, special education paraprofessional. Rachel has worked here in the past and she's back with us, which is great. Melissa DiLorenzo is a special education paraprofessional. Uh, Scott Vincenzi is a special ed paraprofessional. And uh, Chiara Fredo is a pre-K speech language pathologist. And Mr. Wayne is uh, not coming uh, to the district this year. We have just reposted that position of uh, school psychologist long-term sub at the middle school. So that is our update. Thank you very much. Do we have a lot of positions still open or are we doing pretty well to be mm -hmm. ready to go? Doing doing pretty well. We have a few that are that are coming in um, that we need to get posted. But um, at the moment, we're, we're doing pretty well. Excellent. And and, and for subs, I mean, are we doing everything we can, everything we can to make sure we're going to have subs still? <laughs> we are. We've done a great job to get some of our, our consistent subs on a more regular basis. Uh, we do still have some open positions for uh, bus monitors and a few other kind of positions that we could really use some some good people to apply for. So, so if you want to want to ride a bus, if you miss riding a bus, contact Dr. Dale. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you very much. Moving on, bids and donations. Mr. McGowan, you want to lead us from the sauna? Uh, yeah, thank you. I, uh, I will. I'll switch to my PDF so I can read this stuff better. If I skip over something, let me know. Uh, but I, uh, let's see, where are we? Okay. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $4,000 from the E. Ethel Little BTO to fund the purchase and installation of one Halsey Taylor Hydro Boost bottle filling station and single ADA cooler at the little school. Second. I, oh, Diana beat me to it. Who had the second there? Diana. Diana with the second. Okay. Any discussion? Do a roll call vote, Rich. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hi. What exactly is the cooler? Filler thing is it the one that you put the bottle underneath and it refills your water bottle? Correct. All right. Correct. Perfect. That was yep. that was my only question. Yeah, because I think water fountains are not going to be or bubblers as you call them here aren't going to yeah. be allowed. Yeah, makes sense. Right. This All would right. be allowed. If it's touchless and it's it's censored. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, so it's Rich on the on the motion and Diana on the second. So we'll do roll call vote. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Five zero unanimous. Thank you. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $1,596 from the North Reading Touchdown Club to fund the purchase of senior football jersey replacements at the high school. Second. Any discussion? Okay, then we'll do all those in favor. We'll do a roll call vote. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes by zero unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $9,330 from the North Reading Music Boosters to fund the purchase of percussion and marching band equipment at the high school. Sorry, second. <laughs> Diana's just trying to mess with Cindy. 
I'm, I'm in favor. I'm in favor of that, Diana. So it's good. Someone else should jump in before you next. Um, any discussion? Okay, I'll do a roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Diana. Aye. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. I'm in aye as well. Ask this five zero unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation amounts totaling one hundred and twenty dollars from parents of Mrs. Hewitt's. 2019-2020 fourth grade class to be used towards two $250 scholarships for graduating seniors for the 2020-2021 school year at the high school. Second. Disappointed in you, Chris. I thought you were going to jump in before her. No, <laughs> I'm not that heartless. Roll call vote, Rich. Aye. Diana. Aye. Uh, Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. I'm um, an I as well. Passes by zero. You can jump in, Scott, if you want to do it. I don't know why we don't second from the chair, but I don't know. Mel and Jerry never did, so I don't. <laughs> or do motions. Last one. I moved the, the school. Did you Did you actually vote? Uh, I did. I did. Five, five zero. Okay. I uh, I moved that the school committee vote to accept gratitude a donation of two hundred and fifty eight dollars and thirty five cents from the E Ethel Little PTO to fund the purchase of headphones at the little school. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Diana. Aye. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Five zero again. Thank you. Is that the last one, I believe? I think so. Yes, yep. it is. Okay. Um, subcommittee updates. We just had finance planning team on August 21st. Rich, you want to update on it? Your first run? Oh yes. Right. Well, it was it was quite exciting. Um, I mean, I thought there's not much to talk about. I don't think uh, you know there's very little uh, revenue information that's that's meaningful at this point. Uh, the twenty the twenty twenty books aren't officially closed yet. Um, everybody knows that there's just a lot to sort of wait and wait to see how things uh, fall out. Was there anything more substantial than that, Scott? I don't recall. <laughs> I mean, the only updates that I would say is the one update which came from the previous meeting of, you know, we're since the state is going to fully fund um, certain line items, we're going to have an excess of around nine hundred thousand dollars, which is, you know, substantial. But I think we might have. I don't know if we updated that at a meeting before or not, but um, we're going to have that. Scott, that. a clarification. Go ahead. The town in its entirety is nine hundred, not yeah. just the school. Okay, thank Correct. you. Correct. Yeah. So the entirety. So when I say we, I mean, from the finance planning team perspective, uh, the only other thing I would just say is that, you know, there's been a, you know, it, we appreciate the committed or the, the continued commitment from the town and, you know, everybody there to support um, the schools. I mean, one thing that is very clear from, from those meetings is that it, everybody understands this is going to be a chaotic year. And to the extent that we need any, you know, support, Many people on the town side have been very uh, supportive of the schools, and you know, very, you know, very much telling us that if we need anything, we should, you know, reach out. And so, it's greatly appreciated. Um, administrative report, Dr. Daly. Thank you. I, th I believe that the main part that I want to share tonight is that the embargo has been lifted. I can announce that North Reading was awarded a grant for remote learning technology. Um, it's not quite everything we asked for, but we, we were awarded $137,750. And that is what is being used to help support our one-to-one. -one. Um, and it's also going to be used, you know, towards our continuing ongoing replacement of devices in the district and to support, you know, we, we have a major upgrade needed for our teacher software as well, our teacher's hardware as well. So that was um, a very positive there. In addition to Chromebook devices, we're also able to use um, some of that funds to help students who do not have sufficient internet access at home. Dr. Downs has been working with those families to get them, uh, we can get mobile hotspots for them for a year to support internet connectivity at home for remote learning. So that's, that's great that we were able to participate and Dr. Downs and I um, worked on that grant and with Mr. Connolly. And we're very happy to uh, to share that with you tonight. Excellent, thank you. Anything? And didn't I see that Comcast is continuing to work on their their low cost uh, 
internet access program isn't that continuing they are yeah and that's been those providers have all been great we've you know that's what we've done so far is we've introduced people to all of those different options that are available some of them uh, either very low cost and then during this time of the pandemic uh, many of them have been free um, so we will continue with that as well but we um, we're very excited to be able to help out the you know there's not a lot of families in North Reading fortunately that that have an issue um, but those that do we're, we're able to support them which has been great okay thank you anything further dr daly uh not at this time it just you know some of the things we're going to continue with our negotiations you know uh with, with the various unions i didn't mention earlier that we've met with all of our bargaining units so uh custodians food service um paraprofessionals administrative uh assistants and you know we've, we've answered questions and and you know uh negotiated terms and questions that are related to their position so uh no signed mous with any of the groups yet but we're, we're in good places with all of those groups and you know there are some things that we're going to continue to work on guidance around you know what kind of facial coverings uh, people are going to be wearing and things you know because we're we're getting ready for our teachers to come back uh, just just a week from tomorrow so much to do thank you very much any correspondence none at this time the future business, um, unless we end up needing to vote on anything further, um, the next meeting is scheduled to be on September 10th, um, which, as we mentioned, I suspect we maybe will be in person with, you know, high, with um, remote as well, but, you know, to be determined. And then but that'll be at 630. Um, and then September 24th, we will meet again. Um, good luck to Dr. Daly and the beginning of the school and the professional development, which begins on September 1st, and the teachers and the educators. Um, and if there's nothing else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that? Okay. Roll call, Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. Diana. Aye. Chris. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Five zero unanimous. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye all. Come on.